thank you all for uh, listening to me today, and thank you for inviting me, and for, as I was saying, a ramen, giving me my first taste of decent Indian food since I moved to the depths of New Jersey uh, about a year and a half ago. <laughs> Um, as I mentioned, I used to teach at, at Fordham. I was the director of something there called the Donald McGannon Communication Research Center, which actually, uh, when I left, passed the torch to, I think some of you probably know, uh, Alice Marwick, uh, who was a colleague of mine at, at Fordham. Uh, and my sort of path to this uh, subject area actually comes uh, from my interest and, and research for years and years now, as I'm getting fairly old, and I look around the room and realize I am now getting to be the old fart in the room, um, in media policy and regulation, which, uh, you know, that space has changed so dramatically where, you know, when I think about the work I was doing um, 20 years ago and, you know, to try to understand, you know, the news and information ecosystem, it was a matter of analyzing, you know, a couple of newspapers and a few TV and radio stations in an individual community, and then you, you know, and that's you had it covered. Uh, that you know, it, it, you know, the changes, needless to say, are, are dramatic. Uh, but so, and so, what I'm going to talk about today, that's sort of the undercurrent of this, which is where and how and do sort of our new ways of getting news and information have any kind of normative or governance or policy, whatever term you, 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 you prefer or angle you think is most relevant, frameworks uh, in place or, or even evolving and what might the implications be of, of, their, of their absence or their slowness um, to develop. Uh, so again, so, so to think, you know, my, my interests have been particularly in how different kinds of normative principles have taken hold in, in the media policy making space. What do they mean? Uh, these are, you know, how they evolved over time. These are some of the core ones, concepts like diversity and competition and localism. And some of these are, are sort of general things like competition, but some have been very specific to the, to the broadly defined media space, things like diversity and localism, universal service, all this, of course, constrained and, and, and encouraged in some cases, depending on the context, by the First Amendment. But a lot of this falling under this broad umbrella concept of um, of the public interest, and that and that term is what is really going to be a focus of what I talk about today. Um, so these are the kind of questions I've been interested in: How are these policy principles defined and operationalized in policy analysis and applied in policy research uh, and policy advocacy? Um, I go way back with one of your colleagues, who's back there, Sita. Uh, we worked in the sort of media policy advocacy space, um, you know, back seven, eight years ago, uh, to try to help the media policy advocates sort of have a uh, a more robust research capacity to to to, to participate uh, in media policy making. Um, how do these concepts, how do their meanings and applications evolve over time? And what I've been interested in in recent years are, you know, how are these principles transitioning, should they be um, to, from the traditional media space to, to new media? So a few years back, we were doing some work, for example, on what the concept of diversity means in, in the context of internet governance. How is it evolving and transitioning there? Uh, and today, I'm going to be talking more about, uh, these are, these, you know, this is some of the, the work I've done trying to take the, you know, very focused on principles. Diversity, localism, and the book I did a number of years back really looked at all these principles, looked at how they interconnect, how do they contradict each other, and what are the challenges that they pose for, um, you know, for policy making and, and policy analysis in particular. Uh, so, you know, background on this, and you could read a ton and bore yourself to tears reading about how we should, from a philosophical standpoint, et cetera, interpret this notion of the public interest and apply it. Uh, and a lot of it, there's a lot of, you know, of course, a lot of critique uh, of how difficult this term has been to nail down. And, you know, in some way, some people would argue it doesn't really mean anything. But it has existed for quite some time as a fundamental rationale for government regulation in the, in the media sphere, uh, showing up 11 times in the Communications Act of 1934, and ironically, becoming even more prevalent in an act, uh, Telecom Act of 1996, that was widely considered a deregulatory act. Uh, so this notion of the public interest has become even more pronounced in the, in, in, in the policymaking space. Uh, but the important thing I want to emphasize today, because I'm really going to be talking about this broader notion of governance, is that it is a principle that also has a long history and a, you know, a, very, a strong resonance in, in professional practice. So if you go, as I have in some previous research, looked at the codes of ethics, uh, and, uh, mission statements for organizations like the American Society of Newspaper Editors and the Society for Professional Journalists, this notion of the public interest is very, very prominent 
in their own sort of guiding principles and and uh, and, and ways that they uh, you know sort of define their you know professional responsibility. Uh, and needless to say, it's a, a fundamental justification for the various citizens and consumer advocacy groups that work in this area. Uh, and so when you take, you know, this notion of governance really is meant to sort of be much more inclusive than the notion of policy and to include all of the different types of actors that can influence uh, the behaviors and outputs within a, within a, within a defined media system. So, you know, want us to be thinking about this, not just as a policy principle, I come at this with a long standing interest in policy, but as a broader governance principle, um, which is, is, is something more uh, expansive. Uh, and as I mentioned, really something that is uh, subject to a lot of debate, all sorts of different interpretations over time. Uh, some of you may be familiar, some of you may not, but, you know, historically we've seen, you know, sort of the, the sort of opposing polls on this have been the marketplace versus the trustee approach to the public interest. Uh, and the marketplace approach was, was defined, not surprisingly, perhaps in the 1980s when an FCC chairman said, what interests the public defines the public interest. So really, it is consumer preferences, uh, consumer demand. That is, you know, that is all we need to worry about when we try to think about the notion of the public interest and how it should guide policymaking. Uh, the trustee model uh, suggests a, a, a different approach where there is some sort of notions of broader professional and social responsibility at work in the media sector. Uh, it, it gets critiqued from the standpoint that there is a, whether we want to use the term paternalistic, maternalistic, if I was looking for a gender neutral word for that and there is none. Uh, we need one, something in there. At, uh, um, you know, this notion, whether it is the media or the policymakers, that establish some set of priorities and values, et cetera, that should be uh, guiding behavior to some extent. Uh, so, all that being said, just to you know, give you one example of the kinds of things we can extract when we look at how this concept of the public interest has been applied over the years, is it could generally take two, not mutually exclusive at all, approaches. One is the restrictive application, where essentially we start to delineate various types of prohibited activities. So we know, for example, in our broadcast system in this country, we still have uh, you know, restrictions on indecency in broadcasting. So radio and television broadcasters can still be fined for engaging in uh, certain types of content that meets a very ambiguous and contested de definition of indecency. But then when we even look into codes of professional practice, we see very explicit things uh, that are um, you know, supposedly prohibited, you know, so within the context of, for example, a society of professional journalists, no distorting of facts, no plagiarizing, these are things we'd like to, you know, we hope happen, don't always, needless to say. Um, and then, on the other hand, there's what we would call affirmative requirements. Uh, these have been, historically, it's probably important to, to recognize that from a, from a policy standpoint, much less common than they used to be. I don't even know what these is. Are you familiar with the Fairness Doctrine, what the Fairness Doctrine was? At, uh, you're, you're nodding, tell her what, what, what it was. Law student, right? You have to know what the fairness Both doctrine is. Uh, that's interesting, right? Both sides. There's inherent in this notion that with any controversial issue, first it required, again, broadcast licensees to cover controversial issues and to provide, we like to, you know, it, it evolved into both sides. That any issue only has two sides, basically, right? So the famous examples were <laughs> if, you know, but it's true, that's the way it evolved. So that, you know, for example, if a news outlet did a story about the relationship between cigarette smoking and cancer, um, they had to give equal time to the perspective that, well, maybe cigarette smoking doesn't cause cancer. Maybe that uh, people who smoke cigarettes are just the kind of people more likely to get cancer. And they had to give them equal time. <laughs> Uh, and there was an equal time provision as it related to political candidates that emerged from this, but it was this idea that there was an affirmative requirement to, A, to, to cover controversial issues, but to cover them in a very specific way. Um, that's been gone since the late 80s, they're, they're around the same time. We saw you know, requirements about the provision of minimal amounts of local news content. That went away, uh, but the, uh, you know, just, now it's just important to understand what we mean by the distinction between sort of restrictive versus uh, affirmative uh, types of, of, uh, of applications here. Um, within codes of ethics, we think, see things like um, you must verify information before publication, you must use original sources. So the difference between what you can't do and what you can do. And, I, and the reason I bring this up is it's going to be a uh, sort of a, a recurring theme in what I talk about uh, a bit later here. Um, switching gears now, thinking about what, how, if this concept has any 
foothold in the realm of social media. Uh, as we know, and I'll get to it in a minute, we know it's becoming an increasingly important source of news and information and this notion of the public interest has historically been applied most prominently to technologies that did end up serving as important sources of news and information. So there's not a lot of talk about you know, the, the public interest within the context of, say, cinema. But radio, television, newspapers, it's there. You're not going to find in the code of ethics for you know, um, you know, you know, cinematographers or directors anything about the public interest, but you do for editors, journalists, etc. cetera. Uh, so what's been interesting to me is now that we have this emergent sort of news platform, um, where and how does this notion of the public interest um, you know, take hold, if, if at all? Uh, and what's interesting about this context, and this has happened with a lot of media technologies, is we're talking about a, a context where these are platforms that emerge to do something completely different from this function. This was not part of why they were created. Uh, you know, they go back to the original sort of you know, uh, logic of Twitter, and this was their definition of what a tweet was. A short burst of the part, I should have italicized that, inconsequential information. It's fascinating to me that something designed to provide a short burst of inconsequential information has now been credited with destabilizing entire governments and facilitating revolutions and things of that sort. That's amazing. Uh, but let's, you know, we, we, let's not lose track of what it was originally created for, and because there is, as we'll talk about, a bit of a uh, disconnect potentially here. And of course, as we know, Facebook was originally designed to help college students uh, identify attractive classmates, and it's gone on to become something very different uh, as well, needless to say. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there really has been, and every time I, I follow the Pew Research Center's survey research on this pretty regular, and it's amazing, every quarter, every, every six months or so, they put out a new study, and we see the, the, the percentages grow and grow. Uh, first of all, it's both on the dissemination side and the consumption side, we can't forget that. Um, every newspaper in the U.S. with a circulation of over 100,000 has a social media presence of some form or another. So it is, an, you know, it is a part of their day-to-day -day now, needless to say, in terms of disseminating um, news and information. Uh, on the consumption side, these are the latest numbers from actually this month. Uh, it didn't show up too well, did it? Um, this is the percentage of U.S. adults uh, and where they get their news from. So. 10% of adults uh, get their news from Twitter. I think it's interesting that the number is still only 17% of adults use Twitter, according to this. Uh, and 66% of adults use Facebook, and 41% um, get their news. Uh, you know, acknowledge that Facebook is an important source of news for them. And th these numbers, it's just a continued upward trajectory. We have not seen a plateau yet, suggesting that the role that social media platforms play in how we get news and information is only going to become, uh, is only going to expand, okay? So what, you know, so what? That's right, you know, what, you know, what, what are the concerns that I have here? Why is this, you know, why have I been uh, sort of delving into this? For me, it's this issue of a fundamental disconnect between how these technologies evolved and the evolving, uh, originated and the evolving function that they serve. Um, and again, this is very common. Radio was originally designed for ship-to-shore communication. It was not designed to do what it ultimately ended up doing. People, you know, when Thomas Edison invented the uh, telephone, he thought that people were going to use it to pick it up and listen to music. He thought it was going to be radio. Oops. You know, I mean, so we have, you know, things can go in, in, in directions that we do not expect. Um, and social media platforms, this is a part of this I think is important, that they resist characterization as media companies. So as much as we are, you know, they are serving as a, a media company in many ways in our eyes in terms of how we rely on them for news and information, uh, you can find so many interesting quotes that all have this same general uh, sentiment. Uh, from a Facebook representative, I was actually a number of years back on a panel with a Facebook representative and we got into this huge argument about whether Facebook is a, should be considered a media company or not. They do not want to be considered a media company. Uh, nor does Twitter. Uh, this was just from a year or two back. We're in the media business, but we're not necessarily a media company. Why do they not want to be called a media company? Well, because media stocks are in the toilet for them. <laughs> I've been for a while. Might be one reason. But there's a lot of, uh, you know, I think a broader set of social responsibilities, perhaps, that people associate with media, uh, the different sort of regulatory, uh, you know, um, 
rationales that could come into play if you are seen as a media company. Uh, but I think this is one of the important things about, about this space and about not only how, not how they see themselves, but how policymakers see them, uh, about whether or not we think of them as, as media companies. But it goes to this disconnect. Again, traditionally, if you were a source of news and information, this is a prominent one as we're seeing, that meant you were a media company. But what does it mean that if they're instead, and again, that they'd rather be called as technology companies? What if our news and information is coming from technology companies instead of media companies? Um, we've never really had a public interest governance framework for um, technology companies. So this is the slippage that, uh, that I'm concerned about. Uh, as I point out here, raises questions about the normative frameworks under which these platforms operate. And by both internally and externally, I mean in terms of the regulatory environment in which they operate and the internal codes of conduct and ethics that, uh, that guide, their, guide their work. Um, and again, this is part of what I've been doing with this work. There is very little discussion of this, in, of, of this issue, uh, as, and particularly as it relates to news and information. Uh, there has been, I think, you know, what, you know when we talk about you know, public interest concerns as they relate to social media, I think we've got the privacy angle covered. Everybody, you know, we, we, you know, I, in fact, I would argue that in some ways the range of privacy issues and concerns and perhaps because of the, you know, the visibility of privacy violations that can be uh, detected in this space has sort of really almost obscured some of these other concerns that we should have about um, the role and function of them in the dissemination of, of news and information. Uh, it's easier to find out a lot of times if your personal data are being exploited, less so to know whether or not you're getting, uh, how your, um, you know, your news feed, what's there and what's not there. Uh, so what I did with this work is I looked at and I say relevant policy discourse because it was very difficult to find much. And this was, I wasn't just looking in the US, I was looking internationally as well. Um, where are there discussions emerging about um, you know, potential policy concerns related to the role of social media in, in the dissemination of news and information? Looked at uh, the various organizational principles, co you know, uh, mission statements, things of that sort. Uh, and then also we're drawing on research on the dynamics of how these platforms, what we know so far about how they are serving users' news and information needs. Uh, and these are the key things that, um, you know, uh, I pulled from this work. First of all, and is, you know, I have to emphasize this up front, and, you know, there is very little explicit discussion of, of the public interest in this space. Uh, you have to go to, you know, there's some academic work where it's starting to emerge, uh, but it's not part of the origins of these platforms, needless to say. So what I've had to do is try to almost to infer it. What can I, you know, what, what's sort of the model of the public interest that seems to be at work in this space that we can infer from how these platforms operate from some of the discourse around, uh, around um, how they portray themselves. Um, but most important, I think, is that you know, with terms of how we apply the public interest, what we've seen thus far are articulations that are almost exclusively restrictive. And by that, I mean about, you know, both internally and externally, it's mostly about restricting access to certain kinds of content, restricting uses on personal data. Um, absent here, absent uh, is any kind of affirmative dimension. There's no, it is very little, um, both on the, you know, in terms of professional practice and principles and in terms of the broader policy sphere, discussions of what these platforms should be doing, okay? There's a lot of discussion and a lot of, you know, there's been, you know, le, you know, various policies put in place to restrict what they, you know, to, what they, you know to, what they cannot do, but very little about what things they should be doing. Uh, and that, so we start out right away with a very unbalanced sort of playing field uh, as far as that goes. Um, and what we see, and this is the term I use, I am open to a better one, but what I've tried to interpret what I see as a, what I call an individualist model of the public interest. If you remember before I talked about the marketplace model, which really relied on the marketplace to serve the public interest, uh, versus the trustee model, the individualist model puts us uh, as, as individuals, how we use these platforms our autonomy as users. We determine how well, A, our information needs are met, but B, also how well these platforms meet the information needs of others. Uh, and it's, you know, to me, it's, it's a reflection of, there is a certain, uh, in, the, in the technology space, I think, we do to some extent valorize uh, 
the individual media user. That you know, we assume a, a, a lot of literacy, a lot of capability. I bet a lot of us were surprised. Seventeen percent of the population, adult population, on Facebook. I mean, I was surprised. And this, I do this for a living. Uh, we, you know, we sort of assume this very connected uh, and 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 very media li literate population, but it's not necessarily the case. But this individualist orientation is is this reflection, and I've tried to identified through a few sort of select quotes here. Um, the Council of Europe has actually been looking into, the, into some of these issues, uh, you know, very tangentially. Uh, but their key principle that emerged was that these platforms should provide an enabling environment for users, an enabling environment for users of social networks to exercise their rights and freedoms. And I, I, you know, I would emphasize there this notion of, of an enabling environment. That they just, you know, it's this idea that this is a tool for us to use, uh, and it is up to us for the benefits to accrue. Uh, so that, you know, that that obviously is the interesting, you know, phrase for interpretation there. What does constitute an enabling environment? Uh, Facebook, um, their mission: give people the power to share. Again, empower us. We got it. You give us the power, we will, you know, inherit in that is this idea that. You know, some sort of public good will emerge. Uh, Twitter, give everyone the power to create and share ideas and information. So we are fully empowered. That would be the, the message, the, the takeaway here. Uh, now, you know, this is starting to, this is a simplistic notion, of course, of how these platforms operate, needless to say. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but again, you know, my, my effort to sort of define this notion of an individualist model of, of the public interest as it you know, relates to the social media space is that it's the responsibility of the individual user to ensure that these social media platforms serve the public interest. So it's some, uh, it's a, it's a, it's not quite the marketplace approach because it really takes some of the, the commercial aspect of the marketplace approach out out of the equation, which was there. It was about which things will the market support. Here, it's about us as individuals and what do we want to do with these with these tools available to us. Um, and again, there's a real disconnect here between this perspective and the reality of how these platforms operate, particularly when we think about the role, of course, that algorithmic curation plays in this process. I didn't have the data, I didn't put it up in this slide, but there was a study not too long ago, as we all know, that you know, it's a surprisingly large percentage of the population that does not know to this day that their Facebook feed is curated. They think it is, everything. They don't know that there is a, a, a sophisticated set of selection algorithms at work. Uh, and again, goes to the notion that you know, we are not representative of the population as a whole in terms of how we interact with these, with these platforms. Uh, but you know, so that notion of individual empowerment is contradicted somewhat by, as we know, uh, and that's what's, you know, that's what's been sort of encouraging, at least in the past year or so, some of these issues about the implications of how these algorithms operate have generated some public attention. Um, and as I'll talk about that a bit later, but not, not, didn't really have the ripple effects that I thought they might. Um, this is, oh, this is, this is uh, your colleague at USC, Mike Anani. These are some great quotes from, uh, from some recent research. Um, Someone did some work, uh, ethnographic work on news app designers. Now, it's not social media per se, but I suspect that you know, we would see a similar perspective. Uh, but these, because these were the folks who designed news apps, and they were asked about, you know, journalistic mission, public interest, news values, all those things that we traditionally associate with the professional practice of journalism. And the great thing about these quotes is you could just tell that this was one of those interviews, right? These ethnographies where it was just, you know, you know the one hand you feel like you get nothing, but then you realize. No, this is, you know, they, you know, these conversations were probably just lying flat. One guy saying, I don't know if anyone is thinking about practical journalism and fair and balanced storytelling. I don't think that the people in this space are familiar with these ideas of journalism. In other words, you know, you, as a, you know, hey, egghead, coming here to talk about public interest and social responsibility. What are you talking, you know, this is not interesting to us. I don't think they believe they're important. I think there are no ideals being pursued. Uh, I, I, I worry, I am concerned, and that's what motivates all this, that if, you know, that this this is the, the, the nature of the sort of the professional mindset that will, is playing an increasingly influential role in how citizens get news and information. Uh, and again, it's not, this is not meant as a, as a critique per se of that because they, these, these platforms emerge from a totally different function. It would be like asking me to suddenly understand, you know, um, you know the, the principles behind, you know, you know you know, that, that doctors have to operate under, and when do you pull the plug, and when do you not, and all those sorts of aspects of their professional practice. I wouldn't have a clue. Uh, so they're being, you know, they're operating in a space that they were not, you know, uh, designed to operate in. 
so what do I, what do I take from this? Uh, I don't think this sort of what I call this restrictive and individualist model of the public interest is adequate. Um, that it, it's lacking, obviously, in the affirmative dimension. Uh, it, it, it places perhaps too much uh, onus on, on the individual to make sure that the public interest is effectively served in these spaces. Um, it fails, most importantly, right, to really capture the reality of how these platforms operate. It is a, you know, to some extent, a, a bit of a misrepresentation of, of, of how they operate. Um, um, in terms of the, that they do have editorial capacity. Uh, previous platforms began, or at least early on, uh, developed an affirmative public e interest ethos in their, in their governance. Uh, and so I hope that we're at that point now as it relates to social media. Uh, and I don't know where the, you know, the spark for that is going to come from. I don't think it's there yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it, it will come soon. Um, and that's what I mentioned. I thought when the, when the emotional contagion survey uh, research uh, scan, you know, controversy broke, I thought that might have got the usual policy wheels going. You know, that the first stage, okay, hold a hearing, yell at some people, scare some CEOs. You know, that's usually, you know, they, you know, they, you know, you know that usually spurs some industry self-regulation of some sort. That didn't happen uh, to, you know, the way I, I thought. Um, you know, Ferguson generated the same sort of thing when people realized, wow, you know, Twitter, which do obviously doesn't have a, um, you know, but they're, they, have they instituted it yet? Because they've been talking about curating as well, uh, introducing that soon. Uh, you know, Ferguson was very prominent, but on Facebook, the research showed it was, it was not and that it was largely absent. Uh, if I remember right, it was just being drowned out by the ice bucket challenge at the time. Uh, and so people were, you know, and I, but I, so I thought there was, you know, because again, that's what's interesting about policy making is it never really, um, it's more likely to emerge from anecdote than from data. You know? So, so I, I, I thought these might be the kind of things that, uh, that a policymaker or two might seize on to help really get this on the, on the agenda a bit more. Um, but most importantly, you know, this is where I hope to go next with this is I'll talk about on the next slide, that we're missing any kind of public interest framework for what you're ca calling algorithm governance, for how these algorithms should operate that are, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm limiting this to within this context of those that are important to the flows of news and information. I, don't, I, don't, I, I wouldn't want to try to cast a wider net here than that because that's, that's what I'm primarily focused on with this work. Um, but to, you know, within that is, is this recognition that we are dealing with media platforms, disseminators of news and information. Uh, I think I'm going to have some fun going forward with trying to sort of go through some of these classification issues in this context, which we actually have had historically. So, uh, you know, this was an issue when you, when you go back into the history of the net neutrality debate, you know, what does it mean to be a telecommunication service versus an information service? Um, you know, okay, if you're not a, you know, if you're not a, you know, the, the kind of analogizing that the courts have to do. Uh, if you remember way back, and the courts are trying to figure out within the context of the Communications Decency Act, is the internet more like TV, more like a newspaper, more like the phone? And so I'm feeling like if this is about interpersonal communication, they might argue that, that we're just helping people communicate with each other. So okay, is it more like the phone? Well, even the phone then had common carrier and universal service obligations associated with it. So this is, this is, there's this, to me, there's just this, I don't know what the right word is, this black hole in the middle of, you know, of, of how we understand, of, of any kind of governance framework uh, for how, you know, how these platforms should operate. And again, this is not me saying we need to regulate them necessarily, but it's also missing, I think, within, you know, you know, the, you know internally in terms of mission statements and how, you know, codes of conduct and, and things like that. Uh, and maybe that will be coming, you know, and, and address these issues more directly in the future. I, I hope so. Um, so, you know, things I want to do next, uh, really, you know, again, sort of build on some of the anecdote we see. And, you know, and I don't want to be the person that just sort of is screaming fire in the theater if there's not really a, a, a fire. Uh, but if and to what extent the dynamics of news production uh, and dissemination and consumption are being adversely affected. This, you know, there, there are some ways I think that this could be done empirically so we could have a sense of if and to what extent there really is a problem here. This is really just talking about a, a potential problem. Uh, and so, you know, I, it, being a social scientist, I, I'd like to see a more um, robust investigation of this from a variety of perspectives. Um, but what would the, you know, the, the key dimensions of a public interest social media uh, governance framework look like? Uh, and how might they be applied? We are talking about a set of platforms that really do reside outside of most of the traditional rationales for, for media uh, regulation and policy. Uh, which brings me to my next point here, which is, you know, 
we could look at some of these traditional rationales, things like scarcity, you know, spectrum scarcity. Does that apply here? Hell no. Um, you know, the public resource, no, nope, the internet was fairly well privatized early on. Uh, pervasiveness, this one has always sort of lived on the fringes of media regulation when media technology has been deemed uniquely pervasive. That's part of the reason why we have indecency regulation because suddenly you could be assaulted with indecent radio you know, broadcasting. You know, and uh, so that, you know, does the pervasiveness rationale have any relevance in the, in the online? space. It, it's never yet taken hold there. Uh, and, and then, of course, antitrust. And I'm not saying any, you know, any of these necessarily take hold, but these are the traditional ones. Uh, and maybe perhaps there are others that might uh, you know, you know, be relevant in this space. Uh, but when we think about these as media platforms, these have been the traditional uh, points of entry for, for, for thinking about possible regulatory remedies to any kind of problem. Uh, anyway, that's it. Uh, I know I talk fast. I hope that was, uh, you can catch it all on the video uh, later. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. Thank you so much. I want to open it up to questions. I have a couple of my own, but just in case anybody has some right now. No? Oh. Um, it did get hot in here, right? I didn't just like work up a sweat talking, right? Okay. <laughs> um, the, so part of where I'm coming from is media ecology school of thought. Hmm. So I'll, some of this is what um, Marshall McLuhan warned, you know, as a sort of social conservative media theorist. Hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, he talked about his laws of media, you know, so that there, there are ways or there has been prior work done in the 60s and 70s and 80s on how to look at these un so-called unintended consequences that actually can be predicted more easily than we think, mm. you know? So I think, but part of it is that the, the technocratic, you know, um, approach within technology and science is always coming at it from the sort of market perspective of only focus on the benefits. Let's not talk about whatever potential negatives or just other mm. things. So, you know, um, uh, who was it? Jacques Ellul has like 77 questions to ask about any technology. Mm. You know, it's sort of like a rubric, which is to me like kind of like an expanded um, uh, uh, Bechdel test, you know, mm. of like sexism in media. Yeah. So there's three questions, but so Jacques is 77. So I feel like that's one area that I totally agree there's this big black hole yeah. um, that you see often in um, a lot of the urban planning debates too around how can technology be used for mm. better civic engagement. Um, and you're not at all there's whole other social justice issues to be thinking about, yeah. um, access to technology, et cetera. Yeah. So, and, and I would say actually on that last point about scarcity, if Google is doing blimps with fiber or you know, broadcasting yeah. a spectrum, then they are a media company, or there, there, there is scarcity of yeah. spectrum when it comes to mobile. It's funny you bring up so, Google, because they were the first ones to adamantly, we are not a media company, we are not a media company, and I, I think it was a couple of years ago that they finally caved. Uh, but you know, every, you know there's, there's Eight other companies that do the exact same thing, which is interesting. So, uh, and I think, and I think that's really, and it, what you're bringing up is important too, because, you know, the history of the media regulation space has always been about this tension: is it economic regulation? Is it social regulation? It really does more than other regulatory and policymaking areas walk that fine line. And yet, you know, now I think a, a lot of the companies uh, and the platforms that operate here really sort of define themselves more narrowly than that. Hey, thank you for this. It was re really wonderful to hear a lot of uh, the thought process that you've been going through. So in my own work, I work with uh, the intersection between big data and civil rights, and my background is in journalism and the law, so I love this. Um, okay. But a lot of what I see happening is that uh, the regulation that we are trying to instill within certain areas does not fit um, in the traditional regulation that we use, or the concepts and ideas and strategies that have been used are based on really old ideas, technologies, all of that. So my question for you is, is there, or do you think that there might be a way to create new frameworks um, to regulate or to create some sort of legal framework um, than what we currently have? Because a lot of it is trying to fit like a square yeah. into a circle and it just doesn't work. Yeah, I, I, that's that would be my ideal. I think that's, that. You know, and, but, and the thing that's, so frustrating about that though, right, is that that effort then always, when it goes into the legal space, then, then we start doing precedent, right? Pre and, 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 and so inevitably the square peg gets sh shoved into the round hole whether you want it to or not, right? And, and, and so it would be nice if, yes, that the, 
you know, a, a defensible rationale, new, new one perhaps, right, could be articulated uh, and could withstand the fact then that someone could challenge it on the basis as, well, this isn't what we did with radio, <laughs> which in many ways makes no sense, but it's how the, the, the whole process works, right? So that would be, you know, it's funny, but that's what I'm, you know, thinking about next is could, you know, could you come up with one that would resonate and, and could overcome that, that hurdle, right? Yeah, I agree. Hi. Um, so your presentation presents the... Your presentation um, puts this notion of the public interest at its center, but it also assumes that the audience agrees with you that that's a concept that should be maintained. It, mm -hmm. Are there any groups out there that are like, yeah, the public interest, that was never really a good idea? Yeah. Um, well, I would say it was, it, it, I wouldn't say it assumes it, but I, it, because I think that gets to that issue of, you know, is there a way, yeah, is, the public interest has always tended to be this abstraction that some people would argue that it's what, you know, three organizations or a dozen organizations in D.C. say it is, right? And are they indeed representative of, of the broader public? Uh, and so that issue of, of inclusiveness and insularity was always uh, a key issue. Here. And just like for the same reason, people would critique, hey, you know, who, why is it the place of these, you know, political appointees at the FCC? to make these determinations about what is uh, in the public interest. And that's where this notion of governance that has taken hold, at least in the, in the media regulation and policy space over the past five or 10 years or so, uh, I think has, has been an effort to try to address that, that, that the public truly can have uh, more an input in, in, into what emerges. So from a process standpoint, I think that's a lot more possible now than it used to be. Um, you know, in terms of how you can participate and how you can, you know, and that's, and that's one thing that I have a colleague at Texas who started to look at the governance models within social media platforms and to what extent, because a lot of them do, allow for individual users to comment on policy changes, propose policy changes, and things like that. And she found a pretty, you know, broad spectrum with, you know, bulk of the organizations she looked at really mostly giving lip service rather than truly integrating, a, you know, that kind of public input. So I, you know, I agree with you that that's, you know, that should, you know, the, a, a, a contemporary notion of the public interest has to be more, have a more engaged public than the old trustee model did, which was, again, you know, five FCC commissioners deciding, you know, all right, this is what matters to the country. You know? Do you have a concept of, hmm. is there a concept in hmm. those companies that is expressed that replaces the public interest as the value that these institutions should be pursuing? Not that I've seen, you know, I, I mean, not that I can say, yes, it is this. Um, like I said, for me, it is just more about this notion of, of facilitating individual autonomy and empowerment, so which I like, the, you know, if it were legitimate, if it were 100% legitimate, but it's not, you know, that's, you know, my individual autonomy and empowerment is filtered through a, you know, a set of, of selection criteria that will determine who gets to hear what I say and who doesn't, uh, what, you know, amongst all the users of the social media platforms, right? Because, you know, of, of the role that this algorithmic curation plays in the process. So there's a lot of other considerations and, you know, they might be commercial, they might be issues of efficiency, they could be all sorts of things. Um, you know, that's what's interesting when people are doing research on algorithms now realize is that even ha the ultimate outputs don't necessarily reflect the visions of the designers because these things learn and, 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 you know, and, and, and evolve over time independent of, of their own inputs. So yeah, so that, that you know, could that be a, a sufficient, you know, and, and I, I, have to, I have to ask myself whether I'm that person who's more, you know, collectivist versus individualist in some ways in terms of uh, how, how, how the public good is best served and I, I don't know the answer. So, uh, <laughs> so your critique is, your critique is not, your critique is not that these companies do not uphold the public interest. Your critique is these companies do not uphold whatever good they claim to be pursuing. My, my critique is that there is no public interest framework yet that, you know, expressed that constrains or encourages certain types of behaviors within this particular context that I, of, of, of news and information. That they are lacking the kinds of, 
you know, that these are news organizations that have engaged in none of the articulation of news values, et cetera, that have traditionally characterized news organizations. And I'm uncomfortable with that being the case. So they're, you know, again, that they're engaged in a function that they're never were designed to do from an organizational standpoint, from a culture standpoint, et cetera. So that, that's the disconnect that, that is, is, is where my critique is. I'm going to take moderator privilege just really quickly because I know there were other hands up. Um, one thing I find very interesting, though, is that when we think about the public interest with social media, we think about this concept of participatory politics. Right. So government is actively relying on these social media companies as one way to have citizens oh, yeah. engage directly with government. And it's yeah. something that's actually become part of like eGov strategy. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, they're also relying on the capacity of these companies to, also, to shut down that right. communication. So yeah. one really strange thing about the emotional contagion study that I really didn't understand the disconnect between what was being reported on, because mainly people were upset about funding um, of the study and um, research ethics, right. instead of trying to understand the consequences of right. that type of study and how it might apply to social movements. So, um, I don't know if that's a question or not, but it's a comment on like this fundamental disconnect between we do have a concept of the public interest yeah. Yeah. Uh, for social media in participatory politics, yeah. uh, but we have no way of safeguarding it, and that yeah. doesn't seem to be yeah. of concern anyway. But as a, yeah, and I think you're all right. As another, as a feedback mechanism, as a data gathering mechanism of 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 the of the sentiment of the public and the wishes of the public. I remember this is years back. It uh, was when. Um, um, the first of the stimulus money was first getting instituted. And I was at a conference with a bunch of Nielsen media research folks. And they said, yep, tomorrow we're going down to DC. We want to get ourselves some of that stimulus money because they want it to be the White House's analytics company, that we are going to scrape the web and tell you everything about uh, the American public that you need to know. Uh, and this is, this is, this is you know, years and years ago now, right? But, uh, so I think from that, you know, from that f standpoint of, of information flowing uh, and being a mechanism for trying to assess the public um, it's, you know, and, and allowing for some means of political participation, absolutely. But I'm talking about the, the flows also the other way and, 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 inter and internally in terms of the news that informs how these publics participate. Um, you know, how is that process working? Because we've essentially taken a new gatekeeper and inserted it between the traditional gatekeeper. We have our, our news outlets. And again, that's the main reason why Facebook and Twitter declare they are not media companies because they do not create content. As we know now, Facebook, Facebook will host the content. They don't want you to actually go to the new site. They would rather host it themselves, but they do not want to engage in any of the creation of it. There's nobody working at either of those companies whose job is journalist. No one has that title on their business card. They don't want to go that route, right? Uh, so, so now there's you know, a, a whole different type of gatekeeping apparatus <coughs> at work because the news organizations then need to figure out and, as, as, and, and be as strategic and as effective as possible as you know, trying to learn. And there's, this is a, you know, a lot of money to be made if you want to start trying to figure out you know, for news outlets you know, what type, type of stories get shared the most, what type of stories show up in news feeds the most, uh, because that's what they're obsessed with, because this is their new distribution platform. Uh, and it's becoming, as the data show, increasingly important way of you know, getting in front of people. They don't even, you know, search used to be, no, 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 you know, forget it, you know, no one's searching for news anymore. It will, you know, it, it, it needs to be placed in front of them through their social media. That is super interesting. I, I have a question about, like, uh, related to how you focus on the original intent of these platforms and what they really ha are. Mm -hmm. And about that, I see that basically as a negotiation. These platforms come into the world and they find ways of being and kind of putting themselves out there and having a role and having a function that becomes increasingly a social and a political mm -hmm. function and maybe them kind of negotiating the responsibilities with respect to that. Mm -hmm. And then, but what you said about that seems to be very much in the original, like when these platforms were created. I was wondering if we could look also at that original function more in terms of how their business models are being developed. And I don't think you said very yeah. much about how monetization strategies fit into, yeah. um, fit into this kind of public interest thinking about the role of these platforms. And I, I was yeah. wondering if you could say a little bit more about that, because in yeah. a way I have, I have the feeling that, that that may be a more productive 
kind of way to start thinking like what are the origins of these platforms and to see how after maybe an initial phase of just building something that works, they start to kind of be a, a real company that, that yeah. is sustainable and makes some money. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it is interesting to watch how that process worked. Right? I mean, when Twitter started out, they prided themselves, right? They prided themselves on the fact that they had no business model. And when they, they're, you know, Early on, right, one of their original revenue streams they decided, and we often see this, going back to McLuhan, all right, that oftentimes the business of new media is old media. Um, you know, that, that the content that you know, fuels new media is old media. So one of Twitter's earliest uh, you know, business model directions was, we want to figure out a way to um, support and monetize television. Right? So that's, uh, you know, now, now Twitter is the, you know, the secondary currency in the marketplace for Television audience. It's interesting that even though 17% of the population is all that uses Twitter, you know, the number of tweets a TV show generates is now a big source of, of, of you know, data for how ad dollars get allocated, right? Uh, so, I mean, I think it would be an interesting thing to look at historically. I mean, ultimately, I think it's just this incredibly opportunistic. Uh, yeah, that it's, you know, we created this thing, you know, for what, you know, for reasons of our own curiosity. It might be something as simple as that. And then is this process of going out and finding where the most capturable money is, right? Uh, and so, you know, it's only now, now Facebook, you know, that's the thing. They, it's certainly today, right? I mean, are you going to look to news? I mean, the news industry is circling the drain because their business model is shot, right? So I don't think that's why, you know, that they get to serve in this and will only serve in this intermediary capacity and not really try to make this. And maybe that's the most, you know, disconcerting part of this, that news isn't really, you know, that they don't have that same kind of economic investment in it. So, you know what, what if, you know, pictures of my son at Hawaiian Shirt Day, what I posted today, people, you know, tend to engage with those a lot more than a story I post from the New York Times. You know what, remember that quote, you know, we don't really think about, you know, these are not the value schemes that are driving this process. Uh, so that's, you know, I don't know if that answers your question. I probably just keep rambling on this if uh, given the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so another question I had is: Is it possible that like one of the dominant responses to these platforms for law regulation has been intermediary liability exemptions? I think that's been really one of the dominant frames in which they have operated yeah. and they have claimed. And is it possible that that has really crowded out this public interest uh, perspective and that also created this uh, like? the lack of the affirmative and, yeah. and much, very much of that restrictive kind of governance. Uh, I think that's a good question, because you know, if you go back early on, I'm going thinking back even to the days of where at least some of these issues first arose with AOL, right? And nobody wanted to be the regulator in the first internet boom to be able to be accused of discouraging innovation. And the argument was, look, if you start imposing these kind of uh, liabilities on these platforms, um, then you're going to stifle innovation. Uh, so I, yeah, I think the question is now is you know has perhaps that ship sailed? Is that era maybe is that not something we need to concern ourselves with anymore? I think of the analogy with the in, in the media space where there was you know regulations in place when the, you know that reflected a time when there were three broadcast networks, and then in the 1990s the FCC said wait a minute we don't need these regulations anymore that you know that don't allow these content providers to participate in these in these different markets and they went away as a reflection of a much different space. Do we need to worry at this point about discouraging innovation in, the, in that same way? This is not a, you know, a nascent, you know, technology anymore. That's, you know, interesting question. I read another question. Sorry. I know there's another. Um, a lot of what we think in terms of the public interest in news media, um, in terms of the normative perspective, actually emerged um, because of, or I'll just give the example. So the New York Times concept of a fair and balanced and objective journalism emerges out of yellow journalism because right. it's their way to distinguish themselves between, from themselves and other media companies. Do you think that a similar sort of thing might happen here? Or is there just not enough competition uh, I, between I, social media companies for those kinds of values to emerge kind of more organically out of this notion of competition? I think there's a, that's a reasonable possibility. And the only caveat I would say is the, the difference between um, the New York Times and social media platforms uh, are switching costs and lock-in. You know, 
the process that if someone offers me a social, and again, there's not that there's, and you, you, you know, I, I'm curious how many of us, how many of us, how many social media platforms do you use regularly, right? So it's not as if you have to abandon Facebook if there is another social media platform that is providing this service in a better way. But I think what actually happens in reality is people start to say, oh my God, it's too much. I can't be checking all these different feeds, et It's also a network effect as well. So exactly. if you're, all your friends are on exactly. one, then you can't so, actually. You know, so it, that goes to the question of how well competition can take hold in, in this space. I mean, the number of, you know, how much time you've invested in your LinkedIn contacts and your Facebook friends and all that, that does have a, you know, there's, there are, you know, impede to some extent. Not, not you know, I, I, I don't know if economists have figured this out yet or not. We need to know. You know, but it does discourage, makes it a little less likely that you might switch or, or, or consume multiple social media platforms relative to, I mean, the research shows in the days when there were, you know, five, six papers in New York City, people read three or four papers on average, you know, so they, they really would do this, you know, so, so there, I think that's, that would be the key difference. That would be the only, you know, reason I'd be, you know, concerned that it might not happen. Um, so you've presented three frameworks for media regulation, the um, marketplace model, the trustee model, and the individualist model. Uh -huh. um, but you've also made mention several times of algorithms and, and learning systems. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if there is in fact a fourth um, framework um, when thinking about media regulation, especially uh, the extent to which companies are seeing themselves as basically the onus is not on us because of the, the systems that we've created that are then learning in this space and is it that interaction between the indiv individual, the user, yeah. and these algorithms that then um, is, is, is what you see in terms yeah. of the media that you're consuming. Yeah. Um, so I just wonder if, if that too, because it reminds me of the struggles um, and, and some research on how algorithms, the struggles over regulations of algorithms in um, the stock market exchanges. Yeah. So if you could speak to that. No, I think you're absolutely right. And that's why, you know, I hope I make that clear that, I, that the individualist model is, in, is, in, is incomplete. It's inaccurate more than anything. So yes, how that, you know, that, that dimension of sort of the algorithmic curation needs to be part of whatever governance framework ends up applying here. So I, I totally agree. I feel like we're inside a rain stick right now. So <laughs> <laughs> if you can't hear people, just let them know I'm and they'll good. speak up again. So um, I'm wondering where the advertising ecosystem fits into your overall picture. Mm. Because it seems to me that by taking the Facebook and Twitter uh, mission statements, um, at face value, at least in terms of who their real users are, mm -hmm. you're missing the sort of a larger fish in the pond here. Um, I guess the way I would want to ask it is, are the big ad tech networks media companies? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, and let's not forget though, too. I mean, that's that exact same question, right? Is if, you know, in other words, yeah, if, you know, who's the product here, right? Um, always, you know, was as, was as much of an issue when we, when we talk about other news sources, whether we're talking about television or newspaper or radio, it was, the, it was the same issue. So I think, you know, if I'm getting you right, sort of that question of the role that advertiser preferences and audience demands and things like that can play in the nature of, of how news is, is produced and distributed. Is that, am I? Am I yeah, I mean, um, yeah. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, um, uh, <laughs> the question of whether or not um, we can develop a public interest framework mm -hmm. assumes that we we have a public left to interest. <laughs> um, but it seems well, let's like let's not be that cynical. <laughs> well, I mean, between yeah. be, in, in the way that ad tech interacts with social yeah. media platforms, yeah. it is very individualistic. Yeah, um, and the algorithm doesn't behave the same for everyone right. because it learns in these ways. Yeah. So I think you end up having a difficulty constituting a public. Yeah. Um, you can certainly serve an individual user certain kinds of ads or yeah. some posts or not others, yeah. but that doesn't necessarily create a public. Right. But the thing that is important to me about that too is that, and that's one of the challenges that essentially you know, has helped to undermine the traditional news business is that 
you're able to divorce content from advertisement. You know, the idea of, of advertisers today having to ask themselves, well, what content do I want to place this ad in online is irrelevant, right? Because that's what these ad networks can do. They can put the, the content wherever very oftentimes based on your user behaviors and what product per, you know, purchasing behaviors you have, et cetera. So the, the one thing that's, if you think about it, kind of liberating you know, in terms of how these social media platforms act as news disseminators versus radio, television, and print is that they don't have to concern themselves so much with, oh gosh, you know, people hate to see commercials about, you know, after they've just listened to a news story, uh, uh, you know, about a, you know, a school bus crash, right? And so the divorcing, the, you know, the dis dis intermediating of content and, and, and advertisement to me, at least, you know, sort of, what's the word I'm looking for? It'll come to me in a minute. Uh, I mean, well, uh, sort of frees up uh, these folks to, you know, uh, you know, social media platforms from a lot of those type of concerns that have historically been shown to sort of have a, you know, some, some negative effects on, on, news, on, on news values and news decision making. Once the traditional news values essentially have to, yeah, take into account um, how do audiences respond to ads, when are they most receptive to ads and things like that, um, you know, because advertisers now, I mean, the, the placement of ads is, is, exists, you know, and that's what these, you know, the, you know, what the, uh, um, you know, the automated meeting buying can do and things like that. It can, it can, you know, be almost content agnostic to some extent. So you're optimistic. I, 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 you know, I'm not super pessimistic. You know, there's work to be done. I hope that was, you know, I hope that came across. I'm not, yeah. Uh, I think there are there are good things. Absolutely, I think there are ways. That's what's frustrating. I think there are some ways that the potential for this as a news distribution platform, it may, you know, are are tremendous. You know, I, you know, I have to be that kind of person, but I sort of am, which was like, man, this represents. There was, you know, I don't know if it's still the case, but in Germany there was one a regulation in place where, at six or seven o'clock every night, every channel had to show news. Like, if you want to watch TV, you're going to watch news. Uh, and the idea is that, is that, look, there are ways that we can encourage, you know, exposure, the kind of stuff that we think has value for the democratic process. In theory, you know, social media platforms could, could operate a bit more in that way uh, if they chose to or were forced to, you know what I'm saying? I mean, the fact that we have trending topics does say that we do have a public. It yeah. tends to really like Justin Bieber, but Yeah, I'm trying to my wife there. nuts. My wife happened today. She thinks she's on top of this stuff. Did you know Ben Affleck was having an affair with, uh, with this? And I said, yes, I did. Why? I didn't give a crap, but I knew because there it was. <laughs> anyway. So, Phil, you said you didn't want to cast a wider net, more of a wider net than sort of um, social media and media. Um, news. Yeah, and the news. Yeah, and, yeah. The news. and which makes a lot of sense just yeah. because it sounds like the, particularly in terms of the intervention that you want to make in terms of, you know, whether it's self-regulation policy, regulation, governance. Yeah. Um, and plus, if you sort of talk about news and journalism, you, you can analogize it to sort of a long history yeah. of, of that type of regulation in the public interest. Yeah. A lot of people in, in my world are talking about um, sort of ethics and responsibility and sort of public interest, so to speak, while not using that term, in terms of data collection, scraping, oh, yeah. um, analytics for the public good, whether yep. it's development, human rights, yep. um, security, protection, all, all that kind of stuff, uh, particularly around vulnerable populations. But yeah. you know, without that regulatory history that you're sort of drawing from, most people have to go like use privacy as their sort of regulatory anchor, which is right. complete, which I agree with you is inadequate. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that there's a way that your project and your work could sort of serve as a um, sort of template or a, a test case for a, Trojan for other, horse. Yeah, something like <laughs> that, you know, for, for yeah. other um, endeavors which are trying to do what you're doing, but, with, oh. but you know, might even have a harder time, yeah. actually. I'd love to think so, and, I, and I'd love to, you know, I didn't get into it here, but I, you know, I don't know if you guys are getting into this in some of your work, to, to where this starts to sort of intersect, which to me, you know, has become an interesting question as far as how it can, you know, discourage regulatory interventions, which is sort of the data as speech issue, which is something I actually got into in a totally unrelated project related to sort of regulation of the audience measurement industry. And, you know, you know, what do we consider speech versus information? Because, you know, if it's speech, then it's, you know, then the regulatory hurdles, you know, are, are much higher. Uh, so, you know, I think, you know, that, that's what pops immediately to mind as a as a you know sort of a bridging concept, for example, potentially, but yeah, I, I would love to think so. Um, again, being optimistic. <laughs> the, so I'm wondering, um, uh, coming on the the question talking about like advertising. So, you know, Europe 
I believe, yeah, the EU just, you know, enacted laws that for the ad serving networks, you have to opt in, mm -hmm. right? And of course, some of the rhetoric you hear primarily from Silicon Valley is, you know, there's this big specter of techno skepticism in Europe that's really just the old media trying to protect themselves, right. which is their own selective yep. description of the cultural differences between the different political systems or, you know, roughly speaking, between Europe and, and the US. So to me, the question is maybe then, and you were asking about other terms for individualist, is should, would it be more useful in the public interest to name it and say that the real issue is libertarianism or the sort of radical libertarianism, hmm. um, truly radical, extremist libertarianism that a lot of Silicon Valley leaders themselves espouse publicly, you know, with pride as part of this challenge to public interest because by definition, yeah. a lot of that ethical system yeah. is, is in, in a sense anti-public, right? So, um, I don't know, that, that's, I like know, that. but there's always kind of like within science if I just steal quarters, that, are you okay with that? Okay. It's, it's, it's uh, <laughs> public domain. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Phil. Oh, I was, was so fun. excited so about much, this, guys, and for, I'm really glad me. it turned out well. Mm -hmm.